Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a shame I can't see your faces, but um, thank you so much for joining today for this very special event. And I'm really grateful for everyone's time because I know how busy everyone is at the start of Pride Month. Um, so welcome, everyone, to a SOAS special celebrating 50 years of radical gay pride in Britain, not Pride in London Corporation, which we shall delve into. A special SOAS event celebrating African, Asian and Middle Eastern contributions to queer London. <clears throat> we have got an amazing list of speakers for you tonight. Um, first of all, my name is Dan. I'm an activist with the Gay Liberation Front alongside our favourite troublemaker, Ted, here. Um, and I was a tour guide with Queer Tours of London and Minsky in time before I went and squirreled away and just decided to spend my life writing about queer London. And I'm gonna be back in London very soon to actually um, live it rather than just write about it. Um, I wanna introduce you to our speakers, but before that I do that, I'm just gonna say what the running order is. Um, and please, if everyone's got any questions, put them in the Q&A um, the Q&A chat box or the chat box, I'll check both. Um, if I'm going too fast, if anything needs repeating or anything, if you need any clarity, please don't hesitate to ask any questions at any time. This is our special two hours to explore many sides of London which never get told enough. Um, and I'm really excited to, to learn with everyone. Um, so uh, the running order is um, I'm going to read everyone's um, biographies. So a short film um, about the 50th anniversary of the Gay Liberation Front two years ago, which led to the 50th anniversary of the first Radical Gay Pride this year on July the 1st. And I really hope everyone can join us on the steps of St. Martin's in the Field Church in Trafalgar Square at 1 p.m. Friday, July the 1st, where Ted and the other icons who started it are going to recreate the route and tell us what mischief they got on on the way 50 years back in 1972. Um, so we're going to start with a the video, then Ted from the Gay Liberation Front, then Marwan, then Chiwan and Jamie, and then Asif. Um, and everyone's, uh, I'm going to read everyone's um, biography. Um, Marwan Kabur is a Beirut-born, London-based graphic designer, visual artist, and founder of Taqueer, a bilingual online platform and archive exploring queer narratives in Arab history and popular culture. <clears throat> Marwan was formerly senior direct, direct designer at Barnbrook, where he designed the much celebrated Rihanna book, as well as a wide portfolio of projects ranging from exhibition design, book design, marketing campaigns, branding, and art direction. He has worked with some of the world's most exciting cultural institutions and publishers, including I'm not going to say right, quite Baidon, Art Basel, v and Museum, Hems and Hudson, Serpentine Galleries, Hayward Gallery, Somerset House, and South London Gallery. In 2020, Marwan established his independent design practice. Thank you for joining us, Marwan. Um, and from Queer China UK, we've got, um, I'm going to have to I could tell me off of not pronouncing your name right, Chi Wen, um, who has eight years of experience in activism, community building, and empowerment. Chiwen established Queer China UK after realizing the intersectional invisibility of the Chinese LGBTQIA plus community. Jamie, also from Queer China, is an independent filmmaker and photographer. Jamie is the director of a documentary and photo project called Safe Distance. Jamie is also the co-founder of Queer China UK. Um, then we have Asif, uh, Asif Nihan, um, who's calling from Dhaka in Bangladesh at the moment. Thank you so much for, for calling in. Um, Asif has been working with the leading private and discreet Bangladeshi LGBTQIA plus group since 2015. And Asif's um, expertise is in fundraising, organizing and managing events, working as admin for online LGBTQIA plus groups, organizing and leading private tours inside the country for the community people. Wow. And Asif and myself, and maybe some of the others, um, are part of the Rainbow Tree, a really exciting and ev fast evolving um, online 
a global Bangladeshi LGBTQIA platform. Obviously, I'm not Bangladeshi, um, I'm an ally. And over the years with Maz and Tash and Cynthia and others in London, we've been building a big kind of movement of solidarity and support um, with mainly the East End Bangladeshi queer community, but beyond. And last but not least, we have Ted Brown, um, Gay Liberation Front, Black LGBTQIA activist, member of the GLF, Gay Liberation Front since 1970, and is the man who held a mass kissing and made history. Born Theodore York Walker Brown, 1950, in New York of Jamaican parents involved in the NAACP. This erstwhile legal case worker, journalist and yoga teacher found this background to be life affirmingly inspirational. Arriving in England, Ted came out to his supportive family in 1965 and found further inspiration when hearing of the Stonewall uprisings in New York, June 1969. In 1970, Ted first met and joined the GLF after viewing Hollywood's first ever gay movie, The Boys in the Band. GLF were demonstrating outside um, the Lesser Square Empire, I believe, um, against the film. Motivated by heroes like Huey Newton and Bayard Rustin to expand queer rights, demand to calls for justice for all, Ted became active in the GLF and took the only photographs of the first march through London by queer people, GLF's youth group Age of Consent Equality Demands, August 1971. Um, Ted lived in a GLF commune for three years, worked for Gallup, the anti-LGBT hate crime movement, wrote for Gay Times magazine, co-founded co Black Lesbians and Gays Against Media Homophobia, which successfully fought media attacks on Black gay footballer Justin Fashnu and against Buju Banton's viciously homophobic song, Boom Bye Bye. As Ted Walker Brown quoted in book, Ted Wal the, Ted's quoted in books, Blowing the Lid and No Bath for Plenty of Bubbles and my book, which is in here somewhere, United Queerdom. And I've been, your ears must be read 24 seven as I've been writing about you for the new book, Ted, um, Queer Footprints. And actually Queer Footprints is the new book I'm working on, which initially was gonna be 40 tours of, walking tours, immersive tours in a book of, of London. Um, now I've had to reduce it to 10 because I've done too much research. Um, and I'm personally gonna find this super useful for incorporating everything into the book, which I hope we can have further conversations about that. Um, but before I show the film, can we just do a quick go round of our amazing speakers, telling us how you're doing, how's your day been? And if there's anything particularly you'd like to learn and explore with each other over the next hour and 45 minutes. Um, don't be shy, jump in whenever you want. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marwan Kapoor. I'm the founder of Tequir, as Dan mentioned. Um, I've had a pretty busy day, actually, today. It's been a bit manic, but I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about my own experience and hearing everybody's um, and seeing how our trajectories connect and overlap. Mm. So it's about, thank you, Marwan. So it's about connecting trajectories and overlapping trajectories. Because mm -hmm. I, I think we're all operating in our own, I don't want to say isolated, but we all have uh, a particular set of circumstances that creates our individual queer identities that in, in one way or another sit outside of the, let's say the mainstream notion of, of what queer is. And um, I think we all spend a lot of time trying to make sense of it, where me as an Arab individual, someone else from their own culture, and I'd, I'd be interested to see where these trajectories overlap and where they differ because um, I think being queer means many different things, uh, depending on the background and the culture and the history that you have. Amazing. Thank you so much, Marwan. I can't wait. I've been following your stuff for ages and I'm so excited <laughs> to connect with you. Um, so thank you. Who wants to jump in next? Don't be shy. I know none of you are shy. Go on, Ted, you're on mute, babes. <coughs> well, unfortunately, I have something, maybe a flu or something that's been bugging me for the best part of a week. 
but there have been, and I was just on the phone a moment ago with somebody from The Guardian, as a lot of the press and the media are now paying attention because the 50th anniversary is coming up on the 1st of July. Um, but I'm also reading a lot of material, some of it quite a progressive and advanced. Um, for example, here, there's a newspaper called I in Britain, which is associated with the Guardian newspaper. And here's an article by a lesbian writer there which is making some of the points that I have been making for some time, because uh, you may know that many companies are jumping on the bandwagon of um, LGBT rights and pretending that they actually care, when in fact what they're trying to do is promote and advertise their own products and their own services. And um, unfortunately, one of the major organizations in the country that's supposed to be leading the LGBT community, um, Pride in London, is succumbing to exactly that kind of fake um, promotions. They're actually not really in support of LGBTQIA rights. They're just about turning it into a party and making it fun. So again, for example, I'll just read you one paragraph um, a quite meaningful paragraph from this article. And um, Eleanor Margolis, who wrote it, is an out lesbian. And she is arguing that pride has become actually something for straight people. And I'll read you the second to last paragraph here. Perhaps it's time for queer people to ditch pride in entirely and pin our yearly celebration of ourselves to Eurovision and Eurovision only, plus maybe a little bit of Halloween for all the queer horror, horror obsessives out there. Both occasions are deeply camp and involve dressing up. Leave pride for the straights. They need it more than us to convince themselves that they're doing their bit to fight prejudice, bless them. <laughs> yeah. wow. And it's a, a sus of what's been going on. Now, as um, as Dan has pointed out, we, the real veterans of GLF, are holding our Pride celebration on the 1st of July, but Pride in London are doing theirs on the 2nd of July, and they have a massive amount of publicity most of which tries to imply that the first pride was something to do with them, even though the first pride took place 45 years before they even existed, right? And they've actually taken one of my photographs of the first pride and labeled it as the launch of Pride in London in 1972. And we are in a real, real battle with these people because they will be getting all the publicity and uh, charging people or forcing them to wear armbands to participate in an event that should be for the LGBT community to run for itself and run by itself. But the, the flame still exists. There are still people who care about our communities and care about humanity and justice and fairness, and we are going to continue fighting for them. Oh, thank That's you. That's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, just very quickly, and just be a moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great to hear, Ted. Yeah, Dan was talking about the book. Here is the first book about the Gay Liberation Front. And you can see people recreating the kiss-in that we initiated in the first March on 1971, uh, which I kind of became famous for. But in this one, what happened was we gathered at Trafalgar Square and GLF members dressed up as male and female in such a way that when they were kissing each other, 
You couldn't tell whether it was men kissing men, women kissing women, men kissing women, or anything in between. But we were really challenging the law at the time because this kind of sexuality in public could lead to a seven year prison sentence. That's how radical people were. They were daring and public in challenging the homophobia of those, those days. So this is the book and it includes quotes from all the major um, GLF activi action, sorry, <laughs> activists um, and is a strong and important memory for all of us. Oh, thank you so much, Sid. I'll share the link round as well to the amazing No Bath But Plenty of Bubbles. And I shared the feature with you in The Guardian about the kissing. Um, but from what I'm hearing you say, Ted, it's, it's focusing more on celebrating and continuing the journey for radical queer intersectional pride and absolute freedom for all and challenging um, the Pride in London corporate, I'm not allowed to swear, I don't think, stuff. Um, I mean, that article was so funny, uh, leave pride to the straits. Um, but yeah, so focusing on pride this year, obviously, as the, as the 50th anniversary. Um, so thank you, Ted, and um, I hope you feel better soon. Um, Can I just add one, one quick thing? Th to show how things have, have, have changed, um, on Sunday, there was the Queen's pageant celebrating 70 years, her 70 years on the throne in Great Britain for, you know, Queen Elizabeth the first, right? Uh, second, sorry. <laughs> and um, there was a, a contingent of LGBT people involved and it does show that there's been a certain amount of acceptance, but unfortunately, a lot of people watching the LGBT faction in that group will be under the impression that those people were supporting the Queen. But in fact, they were only appearing because they wanted to make sure that this program, which is going to be circulated around the world, would actually be inspirational for people in the Commonwealth, in the 34 countries where homosexuality is illegal, to see what can be achieved by fighting back against prejudice. That even the Queen has to acknowledge our existence and, and a certain amount of our acceptance. Amazing, but and uh, you know that in terms of Marwan's thoughts about traject uh, overlapping trajectories, like we obviously cannot uh, not talk about the, the cruelty of the British Empire um, and the meaning of that today in terms of the Jubilee as well. So anyone who wants to jump in about that, please do. Um, thanks, Ted. Um, um, who else wants to jump in just with how you're doing and any specific things that you would like to focus on today? <coughs> Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Um, I'm Chu Bai. I'm from uh, Queer China, UK. You know, it's interesting to like, you know, have introduced this history, this like conflict between like, the prize and the like reclaimed pride. Uh, because when I just came into the UK in 2018, I joined the GLF meeting in LC at the time. So I know all this like, like, like protest about the prize, also all this like decolonizing discussion. But the things it's the different within my communities because we are not the citizen here. So we don't know the features about how the pride come up, how the pride like develops. So that some, something is quite like different from my community. They understand like from different ways about the pride. And I would I would give up because next in my presentation, I would introduce our Queer Channel UK, the plan for the pride month, this, this month and next month. But I stop here to give, give the opportunity to other to introduce themselves. Oh, thank you so much, Sue, and I can't wait to hear about the amazing work you've been up to as well. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Asif, Jamie, do you want to jump in quickly? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Uh, I was really inspired by what Ted has just said there. And I think it's not just a phenomenon that's happening in the UK. Uh, where like pride is becoming more and more corporate that kind of culture is happening all over the world like uh here in hong kong there's also 
that kind of situation where uh, the majority of the event were uh, organized and the focus was shifted from a protest to to what what it is right now yeah so I'm looking forward to the discussion later oh thank you so much Amy um thank you oh, um, hey Asif hey um I will just take maximum one minute so I'm actually kind of nervous because this is uh, one of my first international event that I'm joining as a panel guest. Thanks to Mark for giving this opportunity. And thank you, Dan, also. And uh, the thing is that I was uh, listening to all of you and the, where I'm from belong. It's a very restricted country where LGBTQ plus are illegal live there so i will talk about all of this and i will represent i will try to represent in a bit of my country a lot thank you so much thank you oh it's so lovely having you here as if as well and you speak really great and eloquently so you've got nothing to worry about it's really great to to have you here and also just i'm sure everyone wants to know how we can like coalesce and support and build solidarity as well so thank you for coming um, I am going to share the screen now. Sorry, for a nine, shut myself up, for a nine minute film about the 50th anniversary of the GLF, which uh, was two years back. Um, oh my God, everyone's seen this one. Okay, I'm sorry, let's try this. Not that one. Um, wait one second. Um, um, it's not that one, sorry, let me just find the one, ah, here we go, there we go, uh, can everyone see that? Okay, great, I love this film, um, You do not live life not being who you are. You live life being who you are, standing proud. Things can go backwards as well as forwards, and we have to be open but keep fighting because, you know, the, the battle is not yet won at all. Rights are not given to you on a plate. You need to fight for the spaces, you need to shout, and it's, it doesn't happen by asking politely. It happens through standing together, bringing the fight to the streets, and calling it out. This is the historic 50th anniversary march on the Gay Liberation Front. We're here to say that we are proud to have been part of the early movement, a movement which ignited the modern LGBT plus protest movement in Britain. So I joined the um, GLF in November 1970 at I think its second or third meeting. And since then, it's changed my life. It's brought back so many memories of people who have, have been friends and colleagues for the last 50 years. We started on the back of the, the black movement and the women's movement in the States, and it was the Queens in uh, Christopher Street that stood up to the police saying, we're here now. And it was such an exhilarating time. And some of that has gone on, thank goodness, and we're back there again, however, because some of those things have not been done. And when Pride became mainstream, uh, the politics went out of it a lot, and we lost some of that spirit. Pride means to me being visible, being out, and defying centuries of 
being invisible and being invisibilized. It's not only a celebration of who we are, it is also a political protest and a mark towards one day, hopefully, liberation, which is very different from rights. And today, especially, we want to send our solidarity to Black Lives Matter and Black LGBT plus people of color all over the world. Yay! It's amazing to be here with all these veterans, some in their 70s and 80s. They're still fighting. They're still committed to the same ideals as 50 years ago. And boy, we need it. Because in this crisis period of COVID-19 and economic meltdown, we need a social transformation. We need radical social change for everyone, not just LGBTs, but for our straight and cisgender friends as well. Um, we are the police. And we're going to be taking over the streets together. <laughs> Today was supposed to be Pride in London, um, but of course, because of COVID, we couldn't do that. But we decided to do it anyway because it's such an important anniversary to, to really look at the roots of Pride, which was radical, which was absolute freedom for all. And specifically today was in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. So it was really beautiful to see the founders of Pride in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and then the younger generation walking past. So it was a bit like, pfft, makes you like, your heart warms for London. on the ground some beautiful cigarettes those are socially distanced bags gay men found it a convenient place to meet other gay men and you would light up each other's faces with cigarettes tonight uh, was about commemorating in a nutshell 50 years of gay liberation starting from one pinpointable night 50 years ago when the first openly gay demonstration took place right here on Highbury Field. And it was because of the arrest of Louis Eats, who is the chair of the Young Liberals, who was arrested for cruising land. We thought it was absolutely outrageous. About 70 or 100 of the Gay Liberation Front protested a torchlight vigil in solidarity with Louis and everyone else who has to cruise because Queer people do not have the liberty to have public displays of affection. Today, it's a, a celebration and, it's, and we can move forward. Back then, there was anger and we can achieve what gay liberation sets out to achieve. I want to think about trans women of colour that are really being oppressed, that are dying. We are losing people, you know, still. You know, and I think we just need to keep on fighting. We are fighting a global force today. You know, and I just like um, everyone to understand and remember those around the world who are less fortunate than us here today. And please just remember them. And Louis Eakes. Thank you. And of 
working at the legend of the gay liberation front and i have a chance to hear their stories it gives us hope and it kind of puts things into perspective that maybe the fight is not the one just yet but we shall overcome we will win when i get tired of fighting and activism i just remember they're still going they're still fighting they're still shouting and because of institutional homophobia because of media homophobia we've never been allowed to learn really about our history and, we, and when we find out actually what are the key milestones which led to our freedoms today it, they're complete gems complete gems because they make sense of everything i was very moved that people who weren't born at the time and who can who could take our rights for granted took the time on a cold and dusty and COVID night to come out and appreciate what had been achieved 50 years ago. In 1973, pretty well nobody was out as lesbian, gay or trans. Now lots of people are out, most people are out, and that's very exciting because it's the only way that we actually going to change things in society is to say who we are. Well, I am optimistic because this, this, these issues are ones that affect our lives. And when you're fighting for your life, you can't give up. Mm -hmm. um, now, let me stop that video before it goes on to something else completely embarrassing. Um, there we go. Um, oh, I love that film. Um, anyone else, apart from Ted, because we're going to go straight on to you in a minute, Ted, any of our other amazing speakers got any thoughts or reflections or questions about the film? How did it make you feel? What questions did it bring up for you? Um, it, it, it's just, I think, quite inspiring to... I think, I think what it helps say is it it puts things in perspective in the long chronology of this battle, because I think we tend to have generational amnesia of, of, of not understanding the roots of the battles that we continue to fight. And seeing a video like this really helps just give context and situate us and to make it clear that the battle is far from being over. Wow, thank you so much. Generational amnesia. You basically just made sense of my whole life. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, thank you, Marwan. Um, anyone else want to jump in with any thoughts or reflections? You're on mute, Ted. <coughs> uh, yeah, I think it would be useful for there to be a, a bit of a timeline on that first March because it's significant that you had Stonewall happening on the 29th of June, 1969. And a gay liberation was formed within a few months in New York following that, right? Then we had the, the film that came out, The Boys in the Band, for Hollywood's first um, film about supposedly from the perspective of gay men, but there were all sorts of problems with it. But the Gay Liberation Front was formed at the London School of Economics on uh, the 13th of October. And within less than a month, they had mounted that first ever march to Highbury and Islington to protest about the way that the police were um, arresting gay men and in fact, using pretty police, they would get the police to go into toilets, handsome police, and if a, a gay man, or even a straight man sometimes, so much as looked at them, they wound up being arrested. And under those circumstances, if they got arrested, they might lose their jobs, they might wind up in prison, they might be beaten up, their families would reject them. So it was really important that GLF initiated those first campaigns within months, within less than a month of being formed, those people were out there fighting. And even more significant, although male homosexuality was illegal, and the issue was the, the, the treatment of the police of gay men, almost 50% of the people that were protesting were women. They were fighting on behalf of gay men. 
and that caused a, a, a sense of solidarity that has continued uh, right up to today. Yeah. It showed that people can fight not just for themselves, but for others. Oh, amazing, Ted. I'm just picking up on key words in terms of like a truthful timeline, which obviously you don't get in um, Pride in London um, Corporation promotion. In fact, I think it's libelous and we should take him to court. Um, entrapment, the issues of entrapment, the issues of exposure, the issues of genuine recognition for those involved. Um, and what does genuine solidarity look and act like? Uh, Ted, we are. Also, yeah, yeah. Just add one other point is yeah. that GLF was never funded by any corporate institu institution. Every action was people paying for it for themselves, taking risks for them uh, by, by themselves and not relying on having friends in parliament or, or in the government or in any big business. And the danger of what's happening with Pride in London now is that the big business has taken over and their emphasis is on selling products, not on freedom and liberty for people. Exactly, exactly. Military, arms companies, right wing groups, the police, the rest of it. Um, thank you, Ted. Um, any other questions before or reflections on, on, the, on the film? No, that's okay. Oh, oh uh, well, <laughs> another follow-up. That 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 uh, demonstration in Trafalgar Square, where um, the LGBT people were um, shouting their support of the Black Lives Matter. Some people think of that as the first time that the Black community and the LGBT community were working together, but in fact, in nineteen in 1970, just after Stonewall happened. Huey Newton of the Black um, Panther Party wrote to his colleagues and said, we should be working together with LGBT people. He didn't use that term in those days, but with gay people because they are also being oppressed. And in some ways they're even being more oppressed than we are and we should work together. So the movement of people fighting from different communities together against oppression actually started years before. And we should never forget that. And what we want to resume is encouraging people to work across different communities for the same goal, which is freedom for everyone. Here, here, Ted, thank you, sweetheart. I dream that after this mammoth task of organizing the 50th anniversary this year that we could go away together for six months somewhere nice and just sit and write your book i've got nothing to say compared to you i just would love for you, for all of your experience and knowledge and wisdom to be in a book at some point um but ted we've got 10 minutes for the floor for you because i want to make sure that everyone has 15 minutes um so go ahead i have one question um, and this is for everyone really not essential but if you can plot um, three max or more, if you want, spaces in London that are meaningful for you and your community's liberation um, would be amazing because it would be really beautiful to build a queer map of radical, intersectional, um, anti-racist, anti-colonial London. Um, so yeah, over to you, Ted, for 10 minutes. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, oh dear. Uh, I think I'm going to need a moment more to think about that, actually, because there are so many places in in London, although you, you've probably already got Compton Street in your list, haven't you? Not from your perspective. I mean, uh, like, OK, from your perspective. So tell us why Compton Street, old Compton Street, for anyone who doesn't know, is in the heart of Soho. Why yes. is that meaningful for you? Now, Compton Street nowadays is packed with um, um, gay and lesbian bars and pubs and clubs. But when we first went there, uh, back in 1972, 73, there were just one or two clubs and you had to know somebody to be let in. 
if you knocked on the door, somebody would pull back a little, a little sliding um, eye, you know, the little portion of the door and look through and talk to you and discuss whether or not um, you were going to be let in. And everybody was very furtive. You would go into the club and if you were dancing together, the, the proprietors would be very careful in case there was a police raid. And they had a little button under their desk and they would press the button, the lights would go on and everybody would stop dancing or drinking because the police could come in and arrest you for dancing with somebody of the same sex. And that shows how much things had changed. And I also want to point out that when we were demonstrating and marching in Compton Street back in the 70s, we had no idea that we would achieve um, a queer marriage and civil partnership within our lifetime. And when you think that what we over overcame was over 2000 years of oppression, where that, that was illegal, it's a, an astonishing achievement. And it came about from people saying, I'm tired of you having your foot on my neck. I'm fighting back. And once you fight back, things start to move. So that's Compton Street. Yeah. Um, then there's St. Martin in the Fields, uh, which was a, a large church very close to Trafalgar Square, where um, Mary Whitehouse, uh, a very reactionary Puritan, organized a, a group called the Festival of Light, who were trying to repress um, sexuality, particularly lesbian and gay sexuality. And they had a big meeting um, at St. Martin in the Fields at one, one stage. And some of the gay and lesbian activists managed to get in dressed as nuns, with their hands together and bowing uh, humbly. And they got onto the stage where the audience expected that they would be singing hymns in, in praise of uh, Puritan uh, morality. But instead, they started to do the can-can, lifted up their skirts, and did the can-can, lifting up their legs, and released a lot of mice and caused the panic in, in the building. And the, the press reported on this, and it, it so embarrassed the Festival of Light that it gradually filtered away. And we had a, a great success at St. Martin in the Fields and that particular occasion. Uh, the third place I would think of would be Hampstead, Hampstead Heath, which is a large park in North London, a uh, large area in L North London where a lot of gay men and some lesbians would have sex in the bushes and so on. And when we went there in the early days, we were giving out condoms and we were giving out uh, notices saying to people, you don't need to just be furtive. Although this is fun, what you want is an ability to have, make love in your own home or, and to be acknowledged that your relationships are valid. And a, a lot of people were shocked, but some people joined the Gay Liberation Front as a result of us going to that park and arguing for freedom and liberation for lesbian and gay people. So those are my three places, um, Hampstead Heath, uh, Old Compton Street, and St. Martin in the Fields. Amazing, thank you so much, Ted. I've actually got this tattoo of the Festival of Light Action on my arm because I think it's brilliant. Um, uh, you see the nun, the mice, and the can-can there. Um, <laughs> and it was so well orchestrated as well, but we can go more into that. that um, and I'll send the link, is also in um, Stuart Feather, our com babe at the GLS book, Blowing the Lid, which is amazing. And I'll send the link to that as well. I've also, everyone just sent a link, because um, the week before July the 1st, we will all be in Hampstead Heath on Saturday, the 25th of June, um, for a 50th anniversary of Gay Pride, Radical Gay Pride party. Um, 
doing a catwalk in the spirit. I don't know if people are fans of George Michael and particularly the Too Funky song with the supermodels. Anyway, we're doing a catwalk in the woods um, in celebrating a celebration of everyone fighting for sexual freedom, where our friend Maz um, from, the, from the Bangladeshi Rainbow Tree will be doing part of the catwalk with um, some of the other activists from the, from the Rainbow Tree. And I was gonna email everyone else on our panel about that as well, because it'd be amazing to all be together. But yeah, please do. Oh, by the way, I've just given the venue away because I've been saying it's top secret, like I do every year, um, just to try to keep the police off. But we all know it's in Hampstead Heath. Follow the signs from Jack Straw's Castle. All the details are in there. Um, thank you so much, Tim. <coughs> um, who would like to jump in next? Who did I have initially in the running order? Um, uh, yeah, I, can, I can share. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jamie, can you help me share the screen? Yeah, I, I select some photos. And... Wow, thank you. Yeah, here are like some pictures I just I chose just when I moved from China to to UK in 2018s because like you mentioned some heritage. That's why like I can see many rainbow animals in London and and then I explore every corner like the queer footprint in London. So so also I believe that's like London is what they say is like it's a place you can love whoever you love uh, like that. But soon I realized maybe it's the, the center is truth, but it's not completely correct because like the intersectional identities, even though like in the UK's LGBT communities, I still feel cannot like completely be in myself due to I raised some reasons, like the language barriers, cultural difference, uh, racism, and also in the Chinese communities in the UK, I, I also had to hide my sexual orientation as a woman, even though I even though in the Chinatown, I also experienced the street harassment. The place like Chinatown, I saw it, repres it represents art, but actually it's maybe not. And it's like that I could not find a place can, like, I can fully like, can, like, comfortably, comfortably be who I am in London. And that's why I established Queer China UK, like the last slide. Uh, yeah, Jamie, can you move to the last slide? Yeah, I um I create Queer China UK. I we are just a volunteer less or committee focused organization. We have to be a home and build a sense of, of belonging for the queer Chinese diaspora and allies. And the moment I established Queer China UK is in was in 2019. I'm I'm still in LCE. I remember our first meeting was in the LCE student units. Maybe maybe the first maybe maybe a similar place like where the GLF the first meeting happened yeah. because I, I know the founder of the GLF LC student. Yeah, that's like, oh, it's a coincidence. And I literally, I literally <laughs> like learn flow, flow, like GLF learn flow, the, the British queer history. And yeah, we had, uh, we had run a lot of the like community event, just like, like gathering or mutual support event like this and the first thing i want to highlight for like, all the audience is our annual school chinese art festivals and the next slide yeah just what i mentioned is that um our commute our member from queer china uk is not we are not a permanent citizen we are maybe like just newcomer that just like living here several years and so our so I want to create a space, create the safe space for our communities. The first one I want to highlight here is the QCAF. It's the, this one, we think that like through ours, we can explore the possibility of activism. We also can like bring the communities together. We can like through the army, like army events or through like every like community art event to bring all the communities together. And they can through the art to embrace the, our culture, our identities. And we still have free upcoming performance, creative activities, and conversation in the rest of this month. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to check it out in our social medias. 
And the last one, yeah, the, the next slide. Last one I want to share is our pride phrase has patience and the community empowerment. You know, like we watched the, this video about the hitches, the first prize, pride praise in London. And in 2019, actually, I, with my friends, organized a Chinese queer teams to participate in London and Birmingham's pride praise. And I, the challenge for me was, I know that like the radical, radical history of the, uh, the, the pride praise, but for my communities, they don't know the criticisms about the pride in London's communities. They also don't realize the problem that it is safe with the like current price. And they even didn't understand like, why the UK black pride and like reclaim pride, why they exist when we already had, had like the London pride praise. So at that time, I was quite like conflicted. And I sometimes I feel quite disappointed about my communities. But meanwhile, I still observe some change happen in my communities. Like, and the first one is that just I mentioned they are main, main, mainly from mainland China, where we don't have like we don't have pride parade. We cannot go to street to celebrate our identities. When they had the opportunity in the UK, it may be the first time they like feel proud of themselves in the public space, and then. And mo also most of them, they would, after graduation, they might go back to China. They would just left UK. They don't have like so much time to like follow up what's the criticism, like what was going on about the price each year. But I still can see they, after they came back, they still post the, po post the pride praise they participate before in their social media in each prime month in the like 17 May. And so this year I, I, this year I'm thinking like, apart from participating in this various pride place, like trans, trans protests, like the, like the London Prize, like the, the first July, we also participate. I plan to also do something to record this, uh, this no history, this, 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 like this, our activism, because I want uh, maybe the future newcomer, they can see our documentary, they can know of oh, this. This what's going on in the last few years, and also just a good document can say our history. And also, I want to put my cross cultural understanding of this uh, queer Chinese communities participate in in uh, in London Prize. Like, what does it mean to us when we are like as a diaspora? And also, like for this today's event, the topic is celebrating fifty years of uh, gay price in London, and is this relevant to us? And then how our communities respond to it? It also the question I'm curious. Maybe during the uh, this documentary, the interview, I can ask this question to my communities. And let's see whether we, <laughs> what I what I will finish this after after this. And then, and then the the last last one I want to mention is that. I had decide and curate also guide the decolonizing LGBT tour in Mandarin and Cantonese uh, in the British Museum and around the British Museum. But I found there was very few story of East Asia's queer peoples. So that's why I, my, uh, Jamie will share later. We plan to have whether how we can like discover our history. Uh, whether we can like have more have more like LGBT lemma related to our communities around the around London. Yeah, and now I will hand over to Jamie to share share her thoughts and plan. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Shuba was talking about documentary. We have actually made one documentary um, last year, which is called Safe Distance, and it's actually going to be shown soon uh, at uh, LSE uh, in, on the 26th uh, as part of the Queer Asia Festival. Uh, there are a lot of films going to be shown there uh, uh, from uh, all over Asia and and the docu our documentary will be part of that. So if you're interested uh, to know more about the queer Chinese uh, lived experience during the pandemic in London, uh, you can and uh, you can go there and have a look. And we have 
done also a collaboration with the Gay Liberation Front uh, in October, where we had this uh, community screening and also like a Q&A afterwards with the audience to talk about like the experience and um, like also to uh, see if there's like an intersection of experience with the audience. And another uh, screening that we have done was at the Bishop Gates uh, Institute, also in collaboration with the Gay Liberation Front. And uh, it's actually very nice to have this interaction with the audience to, to share different experiences. And, and we can also see there are some uh, positive impact. For example, on the day of the screening, uh, there's a psychiatrist who went to see the film and then he wrote about like the film and, and the mental health implication of Asian hate crime. He wrote an article which was published at the Psychiatric Eye and it shows like how this kind of um, uh, community event do bring certain impact in, in other fields and also trying to address the, the problem of like uh, the like on, on the mental health well-being of the Asian community which was often neglected before and um, we also did like a photo exhibition uh, at LSE uh, from last November to March uh, where like people we have interviewed they have we have their photo on the wall and some of their stories here uh, written and what project that you by was mentioning is we found out uh, that there are not much uh, information when we try to look at like the queer Chinese heritage and when we're trying to find about uh, like a role model or sometimes trying to dig into the roots it's it's hard to find so but it's so important for us to know about the past um, to to see where we have come from so like for example the documentary that Dan has shown earlier it really did connect like and what Ted has shown like uh, it made me felt oh they have gone through this 50 years ago, they've taken that much risk. And, and at that time you were saying, oh, it was not, uh, you didn't thought the uh, same-sex marriage will happen in your lifetime. And then seeing how this history has projected, it really has touched me. And what we all want to do this year is trying to map out the heritage of like the queer Chinese community to try to see what their experience were and to see, like how far we have come and and also to try to see where where should we go and to think about like a, a solution and see if the trajectory yeah so that's uh, our plan yeah. oh wow thank you so much that was so inspiring um let's have an informative i mean i've got so many questions but let's go to the floor um the floor as in the zoom floor um for any questions or thoughts on on both on both presentations so far that's from our other panelists and from the audience as well i'm going to look at the chat and the q a thing any thoughts or questions or responses um i think i i suspect that a lot of the um, queer activism is too West focused. Um, I imagine that almost everybody knows about uh, Stonewall, right? But I think it would be very good to know what happened in China, for example. What was the, the great movement or activism in China that help to unite um, LGBTQ people there. And um, what elements of Chinese culture would be positive in supporting LGBTQ people? Because, I mean, for example, over here in the, in the West, there are some aspects of Christianity which talk about loving other people, even if they're different from you, that sometimes some people have been able to appeal to and I wonder what it's like in 
um, those other countries that we never hear about because so, we're so busy here talking about ourselves. Yes, yeah, thank you, Terry. It's a very good question. And also the share, uh, also the sharing, it, it, because uh, uh, what I want to say, yeah, be, because uh, interest in our features, we have we had the LGBT features in like Chinese features, but it's like underrepresented or erases from the mainstream features. And a lot in, in UK, I found like a lot of the academic or their artists or they may they be a scholar, they they, they would like like China study or China's like queer study. I and that's the one inspiring is oh that the outside China still had the space to discover this picture, to say these pictures. And also I think uh, I had to like use the the space here how to collect those information to empower our communities, even though they are they are like queer, they are LGBT. They actually they are in China or they are in the UK. They don't have the access or they don't know how to how to know those those languages, even though they are LGBT themselves. So that's why I I still need to do a lot of things to educate to empower our communities. And at this at the other hand, the last year actually I launched a like small events series or a small idea about the like UK China queer dialogue. To bring the Chinese activists and bring like the, the British activists together, talk about the same issues. The one topic I remember is about the trans one. Uh, after their sharing, you, you can find many like common in our trans movement, and also is is inspire each other. It's not something like uh, you learn from me or or I learn from you. You you find we have we are common even though we are have ha in have so many like. Different identity. You are like from from uh, UK. I from China, but you can still find many similarity. So this is still a place we have a lot of things to do, like how to bring our our communities or how to bring like Chinese queer topic become more reasonable. Uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I guess also just what it made me think from your amazing presentation with two fit three things is you know what you're doing with the meetings at lse is that you know you're creating history as you're going as well which is so beautiful and, and phenomenal and emotional to hear and of course all the like overlaps with the glf in the same room 50 years back um i had one question for ted and then one for you ted did um the first um Pride, radical gay pride in 1972, go through Chinatown, or ha or have there been any significant um, GLF protests that you've been on that have gone through Chinatown? Not, not as far as I know, no. Because I know that um, um, Andrew at Lumsden from the GLF, who was the first editor of Gay News, the first LGBT plus paper since partial decriminalisation, lived at Two A Newport Place. Um, just by Leicester Square, and it's got a blue door, um, in the 70s when he was editing Gay News. Um, there's that connection. Um, but I guess one question for me is like, what for this 50th anniversary, what, it, what, does, what does active solidarity look like for you, for Queer China UK, from the wider community? Yeah. Um I found the pride is a quite a good way to empower our communities. That's why I'm uh, we are organized different teams to participate in different pride. Just like uh, just join their prize, uh, talk to them. You can uh, make some new friends. This is quite straightforward ways. And another point you mentioned uh, remind me that I remember in 2020 or 2021, there's the we reclaim pride protest come across Chinatown. I saw the photo. Actually, I also uh, passed by very quickly, and at that time I noticed because I, I because that's why I go through the Chinatown uh, is the the protest I want to show their support to Chinese communities because the racism, and I just uh, look at Chinese people like in the Chinatown what they reaction. But I I still I also feel a bit 
is pointed by my committee staff, just a project of the child how to show support to us. But we they look less quite irrelevant. They would show that maybe they are curious what is going on. But that's why I'm thinking we still have a lot to do to uh, get our committee know the protest or this like uh, this revolution or or how say how this celebration is important. It matters. I don't know whether. Um. Thank you so much. It's such groundbreaking work that you're you're doing, and and on July the first this year. We will be starting in Trafalgar Square and it's kind of going on the edge of Chinatown and maybe that we can organize a stop just by Chinatown where you can share your thoughts and, and, and your experience and, and demands as well. So maybe that's one kind of overlapping trajectory. Um, any other questions so far for Jamie or keep to Anne? Well. <laughs> I'd like to ask, uh, sorry if they keep, I keep butt butting in, but I wanted to know um, in the different countries, what is the biggest opposition? Because here, we, some of the opposition is political, some of it is religious, and some of it is social, you know, what, what your neighbours say. Right, or what, what the church or religious organizations might say, or what politicians might say about our sexuality or about our, our roles in society. So how do, how do these things work in, in, in China and in, in other countries? Because we don't know very much. As I said, we, we focus in the West, in the West, we're so egocentric here. Um, I think Ted, you have pointed out quite a very good question. Um, and as you were saying, like religious is one of the uh, main um, main obstacle from the, for the West, and that's not a thing for uh, China because actually before we went to uh, the VNA Museum. And if you look in the museum, there's a statue of Guan Yin, which is like the goddess. And the goddess gender has been like, there are different pronouns in different years. So there are years where the pronoun is he, and then there are years where the pronoun is she, and then there will be years where the pronoun is he again. So you can see that the, the goddess or the god's uh, pronoun fluctuates. So uh, it's fluid and and for some time, uh, there uh, we used the same pronoun for he or she, and it was actually um, around. It actually happened uh, where in in London, where there is this uh, a translator who have um, started to westernize the pronoun, and then so the Chinese pronoun suddenly have the he and the she version and so there has been a different influence throughout history and another thing that you say with the obstacle I uh, think for the moment is has to do with the uh, social situation for example right before there has been a one child generation uh, one child policy and right now, because of the decrease of population, they have increased to, uh, they're now allowed to have three child, actually encouraging to have more uh, uh, children since like two years ago. And it, it's also come with a certain, uh, that comes in parallel with certain setbacks for the LGBT community, because I think that's, uh, it happened they didn't say that it's interrelated but when you see the pattern that it's happening at the same time you kind of guess that's why they're targeting you know, they think we're affecting the gen the population or something like that so i think part of it is uh, social political yeah chillian i don't know if you want to add any of that. 
Wow, amazing. Thank you, Jamie. Um, oh, there's so much which has come up. Um, Marwan As Asif, do you want to um, share? Or, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Oh. yeah, for sure. Um, well, just to go back to, you know, the original question of, of, of let's say, significant places to the queer community, in my case, the... Uh, I mean, whether it's the Arab, the Muslim, the Middle Eastern, because that could also incorporate non-Arab countries like Turkey and Iran and so on. Um, we've, there hasn't been, there aren't many landmarks and there's a reason for that. It's because um, we face such strong and, and in many cases quite violent uh, homophobia uh, by the state, by, by the family, by heads of religion, by the authorities and so on that even when we are here um, in, in the UK, which are, you know, like a supposedly a safe space, we are still kind of concerned to be uh, openly visible. Um, and that has hindered organization for quite some time. I'm in a very privileged position that I come from a progressive family that don't have a lot of social or religious hangups. And I don't feel their acceptance or tolerance is something that can stand in my way. Um, I'm also up on, from two years ago a naturalized British citizen, so it has this has allowed me a further level of freedom to be vocal. Um, um, however, I think uh, for the Arab community specifically, I have to mention the group uh, slash the party uh, Pride of Arabia, or they go by POA. They um, it's a group that began organizing uh, perhaps about ten years ago. Um, as a space to allow for um, Arab uh, and Muslim and, and neighboring queers to come together um, in, in a safe space to celebrate their culture. Um, the party, uh, so it started as a party and then it kind of, it continued to be a party, but there were other things. There was a book club and discussions and, and virtual check-ins. Um, organized by uh, a variety of group of, of friends and colleagues um, from different uh, Arab nations. Um, uh, this, the party began in, in Clapton and then it kind of uh, uh, resided in its uh, semi-permanent space in the Yard Theatre in Hackney Downs, in Hackney Wake, sorry. Um, they haven't thrown an event in quite some time. COVID threw a big spanner in the works. But that is to me the, the, the one kind of obvious space I could, I could suggest. But um, again, it, 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 like even if you Google it, you're not gonna get a lot of information because uh, to, to maintain the safety of the community, uh, the organizers would ask people not to take pictures, not to share anything on social media um, uh, due to the fact that, you know, someone might be here uh, feeling safe and, and having fun, but if their picture got circulated online and someone spotted them and decided to out them, that would be quite a big problem. So we, 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 are, we are going through the process. We're just quite early on. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, um, I come from Beirut, Lebanon, which is relatively speaking, uh, comparatively more progressive than other uh, uh, Arab or Muslim countries. Um, so growing up in Beirut, I did have uh, a relatively healthy social life. We had queer bars and, 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 and clubs. Um, they were underground, but they existed, uh, which I cannot say is the same for other Arab nations. But we, we are still, you know, incapable of showing public display of affection. Um, so it, it, the, there's a lo long way to go. But the, I think the internet has really galvanized the queer community to be more vocal because they now understand that there's a, um, a different, uh, better alternative for them. They, they, they don't feel so isolated, um, which kind of brings me to the project that um, I, I, I've been doing for the last few years, which is called Taqweer. Taqweer is a, a, a kind of a bilingual English Arabic word that means to make queer. Uh, or to see within a queer way. It's, it's, and it really takes into consideration the fact that um, uh, physical, sharing physical spaces is, is kind of um, challenging. So I've created the digital space uh, for the community. 
Um, what the project aims to do, it aims to create an archive of queer and Arab narratives in history and pop culture. It tries to uh, either talk about stories uh, from history or instances in pop culture and cinema and music and literature and poetry, um, or even, you know, sometimes queer references uh, from history to say that we did not just, you know, the queers and the Arab nations didn't exist just about 20 years ago. We've been here literally from the dawn of time, pre-Islam, during an Islam and post-Islam. We had a caliph for the for the Islam, uh, for the like uh, in the fifth, fifth century, we had a queer caliph who was having sex with men, women and eunuchs. We had mentions of queer women uh, in history. And, and so the page tries to plot or archive these instances. So it, it, it either, you know, like it goes into uh, literature and tries to dig out instances where um, queer people made an appearance and it tries to share that with the world. It, it goes into cinema, for example, and tries to see where um, uh, queer individuals also made an appearance and they were loved and embraced. They weren't assaulted and, and, and hated. It celebrates queer icons. For In this case, you see um, painter and artist Etel Adnan who passed away last year, who has lived with her partner for a long time. Uh, and um, it also, uh, you know, uh, it also shows, um, for example, this is an exploration of the Arabic language to explore how um, to celebrate the tomboy uh, in Arabic and to see how the tomboy is referred to in different uh, countries. Uh, so it, it, it's a very ambitious, big project. Also, it, it talks about instances like this one, the Queen Boat, uh, uh, the Cairo 52 Queen Boat case where 52 men in Cairo were um, arrested on top of a, a, a party boat and then dragged through the media and imprisoned and uh, there was a smear campaign against them. So it also tries to uh, situate, situate us in, in, in the bigger, to, to understand what our our history as queer people from that region is. So this is uh, this was my this is a project that I founded in 2019 and I continue to do and it aims to uh, I think it, it building on what you guys were saying with with queer China it, it, it is trying to create a, a history or it's trying to create a reading of history so that we understand that um, we have a past, we are here, and we most certainly have a future. And it allows for people digitally to communicate without revealing their identity and to, to feel a sense of solidarity and collectiveness. Um, so uh, besides Pride of Arabia, which uh, I also showed here, if people would like to check it out and, and maybe hopefully they will uh, restart events and you could attend the events. Um, it's a space where um, I feel uh, the digital space uh, as a very valid, important organizational space for us to uh, um, organize and as well as uh, tell our stories. Um, and so this is this is my kind of contribution. Um, and um, it's a project that I feel is going to be a lifelong project for me. Um, and and I think it's very interesting to see how these attempts are happening from different angles of, of from around the world and how we are trying to address it. Uh, in our own ways, because I know that each one of us has a different set of skills and we try to contribute with, with whatever we can. Wow, thank you thank so you. much, Marwan. That was amazing. Thank you. Oh, I love the um, platform for eternal fierceness. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. And all those, how long have you been working on Taquia? I, I began Taquia in September, 2019. As it's it's literally it's it's so sad to say it. it's my proudest thing, but it's also my side project. So it's like something that I do whenever I have time. Um, but I'm now understanding the value and the scale of of this project, and essentially, I would like to begin dedicating a lot more time to it. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, that was my question. Oh, and when you've got a moment, um, Marwan, share yes. this on the chat. That was my question for you. I mean. Uh, how are you? I mean, personally, like, how has it impacted and, you? Because it's such phenomenal work that you're doing. Um, 
Um, it, it, might, it must be a variety of emotions. It, well, it, it's funny because when I began the project, it was really just like, I, I, I need a space to collect my thoughts. It was not about the community. It was about me trying to put things together. And then it started to exponentially grow. And I started to understand that I'm doing something that perhaps within the, within the, the Middle Eastern or Arab or Muslim context has not been done before. And how much value to, uh, to people like in my position uh, connect with. Um, and I get messages of people saying this, this account makes me feel like I belong or this, this account makes me feel like I'm safe, which is incredibly, incredibly overwhelming, I have to tell you, because I never thought I'd be, have that kind of responsibility to, to create something that has that kind of value. But I also, and I feel a, a huge sense of responsibility and I would like to, I'm happy to take that on because I am in a privileged position to be vocal and I'm, I'm planning to use my voice um quite loudly actually <laughs> we where did you do the like firework emoji all of the love emoji. <laughs> um uh, we've got a question in the q a um uh, um akshara um thank you for your question your thought i think the idea of public displays of affection also varies across countries and cultures which is interesting to explore in how one expresses their queer identity um, anyone's got any more thoughts in relation to public displays of affection? Um, at any point? Well, it's it's still an issue. I mean, the, there are two things about what's happening with the 50th anniversary, which is um, Pride in London is trying to give the impression that everything's okay uh, here, but even for people who have been very much involved in the Gay Liberation Front and other free movements, we still have to be careful. There are many areas and times when I wouldn't hold hands with my, my partner. And, and there are still areas and places in England where I would not kiss my partner without looking over my shoulder or not doing it at all because it's still risky. But now I want to say um, it's very easy for people to underestimate the value of the kind of thing that you're doing, because there are two things that are incredibly powerful for uh, LGBT people. The first one is a sense of culture that you, that you belong. It really is so important for everybody, any, everywhere in the world. And the other is our history, because what people who are opposed to LGBT people try to do is to tell us that we have been invented, mm. that we are fake, mm. right? But if you can show that we have always been there, yeah, 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 that course. we've always been here, it shows that we are natural, we are mm. part of, of humanity. Not and to add to that, in, 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 in quite like Arab discourse, or like, let's say, post-World War II Arab discourse, they, they try to sell us this thing that this is a Western import. I'm like, you should look 20 years ago, and you're going to get a very different story. Um, the Arabs have been way more frisky than you can ever imagine. It's just, you've been telling us for the last 20 years that we're really conservative, and we're very sexually uh, conservative and romantically conservative, but then you go digging into history, the, the the near and the far, and it shows an extremely different story. Yes. Yeah. So keep up the good work. It's it's Thank wonderful, you. and and one of the things that we often don't realize is you doing something, and there are people that you don't know who value what you're doing incredibly and it will infect it, it will affect their lives in a positive way from from today till the day that they die and it's really you know good to know that what you're doing yeah. helps people it it's incredible yeah yeah thank you it's huge i i've got one question and anyone else do jump in in questions before we go to isif um where <laughs> Sound like a broken record. Where in London, mm -hmm. uh, and of course you have touched on this, 
Um, where would you like there to be more energy and attention focused on in London? Whether they're places or areas which are part of the solution or part of the problem? Um, where, uh, make... mm, I'm, uh, can you elaborate? Yeah, so for example, I imagine that it could be potentially infuriating or reductive that a lot of the, um, or, or it's also vital, a lot of the energy goes around uh, around pinkwashing and pride and the Palestine-Israel debate, debate um, uh, which obviously is fundamental, but could also override other aspects. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like the Look, it, 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 it's just that because when it comes to the the Arab slash Middle Eastern slash Muslim community, it's 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 a conglomerate of many different countries versus versus certain communities in the UK who have uh, been here in large numbers for many many years and have established very strong ties with this country. The Arab uh, the Arabs slightly less so because uh, I, I guess they are more present in, you know, the, the countries that did colonize them by France, for example. Um, so we, we have, and we are little in number compared to others. So I feel like our voice is still not particularly loud. And as you said, there are such big, uh, we, such big issues like war and, and, and Palestine that take precedence. Um, I think what we do is, what we have to do is just for us to be given space to be to express and to uh, showcase uh, our our views and our skills and our talents and and express our pain and our joy, um, I I don't know where that space is. I think it's uh, as we have seen with many of the people who are taking part here is we create those spaces ourselves. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would I would like to ask before it's like um, give us more platform us more give yeah. us more voice because we we do tend to be um you know but but i think this applies to all of us platform all of us <laughs> it's not it's not just you know my community specifically it's just when these discussions happen um you only get a very uh narrow version of the picture and not the full picture the full picture is right here in front of you actually Oh, amazing. I mean, I am going to email you all tomorrow. I was going to do it today. Um, about the 25th, um, if if you, if queer would like to say something slash have a nice dance around the catwalk in the woods, that would be so great. And then on July the 1st too as well, because Ted and me are actually off to a meeting after this. Um, sorry, I just let, let you off skiving if that's what you were planning to do, Ted, um, for, the, for organising for the 1st. Um, curating the route and it would be so beautiful to have you there and and, and if you wanted to say something so I'll message you about that um, but yeah thank you any any other questions for Moan from any of other speakers or participants you know, me again <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if any of you are um, paying any attention to the 50th anniversary here, <coughs> can we try to make it an opportunity to reach out and make the, the movement more international, that we mm. acknowledge that there are LGBT people everywhere and that the most effective way for us to move forward is to move forward together and to look outside our cultures and for you to teach us, because America and Britain are famous for looking inward. We, everybody else is like somewhere to us. And we know it's a, it's a problem. We need to learn more about other cultures and, and we need to work together and stop being so elitist. Yeah? Um, because we're all human. And we all want love and we all want respect. And that cover that crosses all barriers. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, any other last thoughts or questions for Moan? Or, or do share them in the chat box. 
Um, over to you, Arsif. Um, thank you again so much for for joining. I mean, just just in brief, my it's not my main, but my, <coughs> um, events that with Maz and Tash and Cynthia and others from um, Rupan and and um, the Rainbow Tree is obviously organising around April twenty fifth, the anniversary of the murder of Hulhas and and Tonoy. Um, outside the Bangladeshi High Commission in Kensington. And um, yeah. yeah, so do, you can talk about that if you want, but please do just share your experience and, and, and your desires for a building global solidarity in and around where you are and in London as well. So yeah, the floor is yours, babe, thank you. Exactly, um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So before I started, I want to, answer a question of Ted that he asked, what is the obstacle of your spaces that you leave? I just want to point out to this point of three things that political, um, social and religious things. So in my country, the most uh, big obstacle is the religious because uh, in, uh, we have the 95% of Muslim country I'm living in. So religious is the most important thing here. So in my religion, that's this, this, this thing, the me being is forbidden. The I am, who I am is being forbidden in my country. So it's kind of, you know, that's good for us. And of course, the social and the political issues are there because um, uh, background, I born and brought up my family, my social would not be acceptable as me, as I am. So let's not go there. I'm, I'm just starting. I'm, I will be sharing something with you. Um, first of all, I've uh, been working in Bangladesh with the community since 2015. And basically what I do is organizing and managing events. And and leading the private schools for community people inside the country. And I basically look after the Bangladesh part of the rainbow tree. We are creating a platform. And let me give you a short brief about the group. Uh, rainbow tree is a United Kingdom based British, Bangladeshi and Bangladeshi community group which aims to create a safe online platform for all the Bangladeshi and Bengali queer people around the world. The Rainbow Tree also welcomes all the queer people and its ally to join in our group. The group has currently two parts, this is Bangladeshi and Bangladeshi. So um, it's a contributing and aim to contribute to London for a community though our activities. Here in the UK, there is hardly any platform for British Bangladeshi community people, but the Rainbow Tree has created a private and safe platform this is going to be the largest and reliable community platform sooner or later, we hope, actually. So if you um, observe the statistics, it says that um, half of a million British Bangladesh live in the United Kingdom, which is approximately 0.7% of the total population of the United Kingdom. Right. So we don't have any information how many of them are part of the uh, community, but we can guess a large number of them will be part of the community. People from them, um, people living in Greater London, you will be surprised that we still don't have any proper British Bangladeshi organization community to support the Bangladeshi LGBTQ community. Also, um, we have noticed that British Bangladeshi people are more homophobic than the original Bangladeshi people because Bengali Muslims have prominently been migrating to the UK since 1940, most originate from the Silet region. Silet is a part of Bangladesh. Uh, yeah, all these people who have been uh, settled down since uh, 1940 are passing the hate cradle to the generation against LGBTQ people as there is no one to educate them. Many of Muslim, British, Bangladeshi gay men are afraid of coming out to their family and friends because born and brought in a family which is not 
gay friendly or very religious. So at the end of the day, they are getting married. Yeah, um, we can show many examples of that type of people. Can you believe if all the homophobic people living in London, whereas we are celebrating 50 years of the crime? Um, actually, we, the Rainbow Tree Group, has come forward to create a separate networking platform for this community. And that's what is our contribution to London. Every year, many students come to London for higher education, and many of them are the part of LGBTQ people. And previously, they didn't have any British Bangladesh based platform for support and networking. But now they do research on top of the Rainbow Tree, has successfully made a bridge between Bangladeshi and the UK LGBTQ activists and community from where we both have been benefited. We must work hand in to educate British Bangladeshi and Bangladesh community. We need more visibility and I believe Commonwealth-led LGBTQ organizations can come forward empowering the trusted LGBTQ people and bring the changes to contribute more to the great city London to make it more better ever anyone can think of. And um, I will uh, love to talk about the project that has been uh, discussed or conducted through the Rainbow Tree. It's a book. It's about story of different people from different around the world. It's called Untold Stories. Me and uh, my Rainbow Tree members are, have been thought about it, that the story will be like, the thing, uh, the thing in your life happened, you can't tell anyone, or you didn't tell anyone. So that story will be published on that. It's a one-year project. I am trying to do that. Uh, maybe next year we are able to publish that book in London and Bangladesh, Dhaka as well. So um, I want to share something about the tragedy in Bangladesh LGBTQ activities in 2016. Uh, two of our activities called Dulhas Mannan and Mahabu Konoy were murdered in 26 April 2016 in the evening. And it's called that some feminist group or feminism or the Muslim feminism, they murdered, but I really don't know what happened. So it's a very sad because they were, um, we were actually uh, publishing some magazines named Rupan in Bangladesh. So they are the main people and they got murdered on the ticket because of having Anyways, I think um, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you so much, Arasif, for sharing. It sounds, I'm really excited to hear more about Untold Stories as well. I'm just sharing the link to who has and Tonoi here. Um, thank you. Um, any, any, any questions from, or, or reflections from our panel or from um, attendees? Um, I'm not sure um, if you, if you, because you're not, not in London at the moment, but in terms of the, the areas in London where a lot of the activists are based, or a lot of the, or if you know, the, like the supportive spaces or places, um, do you know where would they be? Um, many uh, Bangladeshi people uh, that I have uh, already mentioned in my uh, yeah, that is the reason where people are, are going to London. So maybe that could be uh, people are more living like East London. Mm -hmm. Is there any place called East London or something? So I guess that that will be the place where Bangladesh people are living and Bangladesh people are living people as they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. ah, sorry. Yeah, no, I know the just I was with Maz and Tash the other week and. 
the kind of dialogue and the work they're building both with like East London Mosque, Brick Lane Mosque, um, Altab Ali Park. Um, yeah, there's a real, and obviously Bethnal Green work in men's club with Odd Butt, Performance Night. Um, there's lots of incredible movements happening in those areas. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Ashes. Is <laughs> sorry if I uh, pronounce wrong. Like in your communities, I wonder the like the the queer women, LGBT plus women, how is like is that there if they have a like, network of those, how is they like? Uh, you know, I I'm not quite familiar. If you know, like in in China, many. Like queer women, many women they are forced to to get married to have children. I'm curious whether it's like something similar in your communities. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, uh, the scenario is uh, we, the LGBTQ people, are afraid of coming out. Okay, that I am me. We are afraid of coming out about real me. So we need to uh, maintain social values and we need to maintain religion. So without, without sharing who I am, what I am and what I love, we are getting married. It's, uh, it's like forcefully, like if, if, I, if I tell about myself, I am, um, 27 years old and already I'm getting a marriage pressure from my family. Mm -hmm. So this is the scenario of there, but because uh, the scenario is uh, we are like kind of locked up. We are not allowed to um, explore who I am, the who actually I am. This is the thing. And yes, we are supposed to be married and getting married here. Well, thank you for sharing, Asif. Um, carry on, any other questions or thoughts? I have got a question for all, uh, like, a, I think it's the last question for me. Please also, as you have been, share any links um, where people can support on any different level or should be, be in um, active solidarity with the movements. Please share links there. Um, Obviously, a lot has come up in terms of the, the issues, the overlapping issues that we need to work on uh, and are working on um, when it comes to, uh, you know, human, social, spiritual freedom. Um, but it's also a lot has come up in terms of celebration through documenting. Um, and there's a lot of overlaps with the formats of our activism. Um, one question, which might be a nice way to end, if there was, because of all, all of you, in all of us, we're all documenting, which creates so much power. Um, if there was one person for now um, that you would, you really want the world to know about um, from each of your perspectives and cultural perspectives, um, a queer icon um, from each of your perspectives, which the world needs to know about, who would they be? And if you can write their names down as well. Um, just like, you know, like you said, Ted, it's like the West for all the many obvious reasons are self-evolved. Um, so does that make sense, the question? I know, I know Marwan, you're like, there's so many that you've been putting on, on the Instagram page. If there was one, um... yeah. Well, it's, it's a tricky one because there are queer icons who don't know that they are queer icons. And there's some who, like, you know, the, the who inspire us, but without them knowing. And uh, there are some who are, you know, more, more actively or visibly. I would, um, I will go with Basim Vradi. I will include their name and um, Instagram handle in the, um, in the chat. So Basim is, uh, they don't refer to themselves as a drag queen. They, they refer to themselves as a celebrity female impersonator because that's where you can get away with things. 
And they have managed to fool the entire Arab world into loving them and embracing them and applauding them while flaunting about as, as a camp over the top women from Dubai to, to Tunisia, to Beirut, to Syria and so on. And they have had a successful career uh, by simply uh, changing the, the way they describe themselves. So they're a celebrity impersonator and it's a full blown camp over the top drag queen that parades all over the Arab world. So to me, that, that's someone I've, I would like to uh, highlight. Wow, I've just checked them out, they look phenomenal. Thank you, Marwan, thank you. And also any other last, like it was really good what you were saying before about sharing platforms and sharing events. If there's any other events yeah. like that, do, do share them um, I will be giving, I will be giving a talk at the Standard Hotel actually. <laughs> Next month, they, they, they've invited me to be in discussion to talk about Taqweer and the project, but I don't have the details set in stone just yet. If you follow the Instagram page, I will make sure to update, which I shared in the chat, I will make sure to, up, to update. It's going to be a free event with a performance and some music and a discussion. Oh. Um, but, but we're still working on tightening the details. So I, 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 unfortunately, I don't have a link to share just yet. No worries. What day is yeah. that? The 26th of 26th. July. Of July. I mean, of July, yeah, exactly. The 26th of July. Okay, amazing. Amazing. Of course. Cool. Oh, thank you so much, Marwan. Um, let's carry on with queer icons. Yeah, in, in my communities, when we, we talk about queer icons, we think about many like Western figures <laughs> because they are they coming out. Like if I look at like Chinese teachers, like someone you maybe think of as a famous person, they are they are LGBT, but they are not officially come out. So mm. it's quite like yeah, it's <laughs> a bit of whether that they are queer icon or not. But I would but when like someone asks this question, I usually would say is uh, you should, like yourself or your friends is the best best queer icon or your your role models. You can learn a lot of from your communities, from your fans. I just why I have so many ideas from documentary, or this idea is from Jamie. So that's why I think we can, yeah, we can, <laughs> we, we, are, we are all very, very brilliant queer icon. Oh, amazing. You're my icon with everything that you're doing. Um, thank you. Jamie, did you want to jump in? Um, I have one that I can recommend, and she's a queer Chinese feminist called Shi Tou. And there's a documentary that she did, which uh, I'm going to send a link over here, where they documented like the uh, queer feminist uh, movement in China. And, wow. and she's also the first person, I think, to come out on television publicly. Yeah. And, and um, I think in, in the video and the link that I share is in Mandarin, but the texts are in English, so you can uh, see about her work there. She has also done quite a lot of film uh, that, that are queer. She's incredible, just checking around now. Thank you so much, Jamie. Oh, and, and both of you, um, any other, I know you shared the event at the LSC on the 26th, the screening of Safe Distance. Um, yeah. Any uh, also in terms of the film, I'm super interested in, in the film um, and how that's developing, and also the mapping project. But any other events, both Chuan and Jamie, that you want to share? Yes, uh, Chuba, you can share the uh, Queer Chinese Art Festival. We still have yeah, three. I already, already okay. shared the Queer Chinese yeah. Art Festival. We have yes. three upcoming um, events, it's online performance. Yes, it's going to be on the 12th, on the 19th, and 26th. Oh, wow. oh I, I will share another one is in the London LGBT Community Center. We we host a Mandarin conversation through. You can come and look, come to Mandarin for the beginners. Uh -huh. Amazing, 12th, 19th, and 26th. Brilliant. Um, oh, thank you so much. I hope you're getting all the support. Well, it seems like you are the support from LSE as well, but it's such an incredible, like, historic connection. Um, Ted or Asif? 
in terms of queer icons that the world needs to know about? Um, to me, uh, I will be common uh, refer to uh, queer icon as Mel, oh. her son, who is currently living in London. And uh, he, uh, I know him, he is a kind of my family's friend. Ah. So he, he did a lot, a lot. The first Bangladeshi queer organization called Boys of Bangladesh. He was one of the founding members of that in back in 2002 or three maybe. He was uh, and he like organized the thing in this country of the queerness and he lead it to the other people and now he is in London and uh, from there he uh, as I as I said before there's a tragedy of murder of queer activists. So from London, he or he or he protests so many things. He sent letters from Bangladeshi or lawyers or something to fix this thing. So I will refer to him as oh. my where I come from. He's amazing. Thank you so much, Asif. I've just shared the amazing article interview with Mans there when he won the Pro um, Attitude Award. Um, thank you, Asif. Over to you, Ted. Queer icon the world needs to know about? Uh, uh, Bayard Rustin. I think I'm typing his name in here. I'm not sure if it's the right place. In the chat, is that the right place? I, I mean, I can type it if you want. Yeah, Bayard Rustin. Um, he was um, the man who encouraged Martin Luther King to have a peaceful demonstration for... Um, civil rights for black people in America. But at the same time, he was openly gay in 1963, um, years before Stonewall, and also while being gay was um, totally illegal. And um, he once said that one day, uh, uh, gay people will be fighting for their rights in the same way that black people were fighting for their rights uh, during segregation and all that in America. And uh, not enough people know about all the great things that he did. He was also a good singer. <laughs> there oh. are some videos of him singing uh, and he's very inspiring and courageous. And I, I'm, devastated that I only found out about him about 15 years ago but considering that he was doing all this great stuff in, in 1960 it's very sad that he's not better known yeah wow thank you so much Ted and if he influenced you then he's even more of a legend I'm just um, taking down the notes um, coming down the notes any other final questions or thoughts um, oh, my computer's overheating. I'm just gonna, I've got, I've got these notes. Mm. Um, let me just, thank you so much. I can't, can anyone else um, copy the notes on my computer? Being silly. Um, let me try one more time. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, there will be further events. There's none as planned yet from a SOAS perspective, because we're all gonna be on the streets and in the woods um, <laughs> and July the 1st and it'll be really joyful to be together in person. For, that just for me, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. It's so nice to connect um, and for all of our attendees as well um, and have the breast, powerful, nourishing Pride Month, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.